What factions should you use when you start a new game of AI War 2? What is up with all these? What do they do? This is a lot of craziness. These are some of the questions you might come up with, particularly if you're a new player, or if you've only played standard games or quick starts and you want to really dive in and understand it. There was a person who hopefully is still around, commented a couple weeks ago, suggesting a faction overview video, 10 to 20 minutes. I'm going to try to stay as close to that time frame as I possibly can. So there's 13 different factions that you can choose from, not counting the human player. A dozen of them are optional. You have to have at least one AI. And so we're going to take a look at those, starting from the ones that I think generally have the least impact on a game to the ones that have the most. And this is going to vary based on your play style. It's going to vary based on how many of them, because a lot of them you can have more than one of that particular faction in the game. How and what's the varying intensity you use for them? What other settings do you like to use? There's a whole bunch of stuff that's going to go into it. But I'm going to pick the order and have a brief discussion of all the factions based on what I think is going to be the most typical experience. And if you don't agree with what I've said, you think it's right on, you got questions, throw all that stuff down in the comments. Or if you're interested in more topical AI War 2 videos like this, I'd be interested in hearing those ideas, suggestions, and thoughts as well. With that said, let's get to the bottom of the list, if you will, the ones that don't really do that much. Cell has engaged the AI. So first up, we have the Human Resistance Fighters. They appear at the edge of the screen randomly in battles that you're involved in. And they may show up, they may not. It's totally up to them. It's kind of a random thing. And they're never really going to be enough to turn the tide. They scale up with AI progress. So this is default intensity against AI difficulty 5. And you can see that there's very few of them and they're not doing much because low AI progress. But also just because they are never a major factor. They will never have territory of their own. They'll never conquer any parts of the galaxy or build bases or structures. There's sort of this there as flavor and to give you a little bit of help. You can use them as distractions. You can use them as a factor if you're going to sort of maybe you attack what they're attack what's attacking them and then they'll last a little bit longer and help you in the fight a little bit but they're not going to turn the tide of any significant battle and there's some rumblings from insiders that they're considering either removing them from the game entirely or reworking how they work in the game because they're just simply not as significant as the other factions and really just window dressing here so definitely the least impactful faction in the game got to be human resistance fighters the other one that i think is basically window dressing although it does have a little more impact we're scaling up a bit here is a devour golem it's very powerful it will attack any mobile ships it can find you can see the vampirism there quite strong it's not worth attacking it can be destroyed but it's absolutely not worth the effort and this is an example of, this is a system that I wanted to take in one of my previous runs, and I just sort of ran through it, let the Devour Golem take out as much as it could, and then I came in here and attacked. So it can be used for that. It can delay you when you're trying to go attack a system because you don't want your ships to get blown up by it. It can push your force fields out of the way if, it need, if it's trying to pad through somewhere, and that can be annoying. So there's various things that it does. But it can usually be avoided. I mean, typically, you know, if you just add a Devour Golem to like an 80-planet galaxy, most of the time it's not going to be around. It's not going to force you to fundamentally change your strategy. You can go hog wild with it. While you can only have one of the Human Resistance Fighters, you can have as many of the Devour Golems as you feel like. And so, like, if you put 20 or 25 of them out there, yeah, it would just make the whole thing chaotic. But that's not, you know, normal use. So generally speaking... Devour Golem, it's just kind of there. You wait for it to move or you, you use it a little bit and then you go on about your business. Now let's take a look at some of what I would call the bit players and this is the Astro Train. Now Astro Trains get spawned all over the galaxy and they're trying to get to a depot. If they get to a depot they will complete their goal and that might be increasing wave size. We're about to destroy this one. There we go. It might be spawning a prototype, which is a powerful unit for the AI to use. But they're quite easily farmed for their resources, which is they boost your science and your hacking. A handful of hacking and 150 science from any astral train that you destroy. 
Higher intensity means more trains and more powerful ones, more dangerous stuff, but you can still usually block them off. Usually people use nucleophilic turrets, build them right in front of Astro Train's destination, and there you go. So in general, against somebody who is fairly good at the game, what you're looking at is Astro Trains are just a way to farm more resources that you wouldn't normally get. They're essentially a player buff, and they're not going to require a big change in the way you strategically approach. So joining the fight. They, again, they do have an impact, but they're not going to do anything to change things up. They're much tamer than they were in Classic. Another small player that actually makes things more difficult for the human is the Risk Analyzer. And you can see a n number of these throughout the galaxy, up to 10. What happens is, they every hour, they will boost AI progress by one. They're scanning the galaxy with the AI, noting human threat, increasing the AI's awareness of you. It goes down by two every hour if you control it, but if you control the risk analyzer or if it's on a neutral planet, it contributes significantly to moderately strong exogalactic waves. So either way you slice it, it's a negative. Then of course to capture it, you've got to pay the AI progress for the system, which unless there's something there you particularly want, might not be the best idea. So in general, these make the game harder to a modest extent, but they are also the only thing in the vanilla game that really adds significant time pressure to you other than the AI reinforcements over time, which only matters that much on higher difficulties. The next few factions I'm going to get into are in the feast or famine category. In my opinion, they can have a big impact on the game, they can dominate the galaxy under certain conditions, or they can have very little impact on the game and be nothing more than window dressing. First up, we have the Macrophage, which is one of the ones that I know the least about, but I think that's going to be true of most players since they've had a lot of changes happen to them recently. Their basic thing is they seed various ones of these, Telia or Telium for one of them, throughout the galaxy, and these will gradually build Macrophages. As they gather metal, they will build more and more of them, and you can see in the description there, they've got a natural limit of four each, they get more than that, then they start to get enraged and go off and attack. And they've been changed. One of the changes that's made to them recently is that they will try to cluster together their harvesters in safe areas of the galaxy to help them gain strength. I've seen games where they're on intensity 10, and after a few hours, the human player is blocked off on their home world. There's hundreds of strength all around them in macrophages. Several tell you in each a, a system that you can see. And clearly the player is going to be defeated by them with really nothing that they can do at that point. Quite often they just don't ever get going as well. So basically to counteract that, I mean, you can you can destroy these structures. You want to aggressively attack them if they start to get out of control because it'll just get worse. Otherwise, you can usually just ignore them. Now, here's an example of, you know, they're fighting off this AI here and probably losing. But this is one of their macrophages. And you see it's got a very high level of vampirism, first of all. 0 0.5 repaired for every damage. It's got the defensive bonus where if ships are a long ways away, then they don't do a lot of damage. So you really want short-range ships to deal with this. And a bunch of them because of the vampirism. It has strong health. So it's, it's fairly survivable to move around various places. But with a concentrated attack... Tritium Sniper Guardian. There's a lot of Guardians in this area going after it, and it's not going to survive long against that kind of sustained effort. But that is what it takes. It takes a pretty good fleet to knock it down. And now Marauders, another import from Classic. And if you've watched my LP series, then you're very familiar with this particular scenario because it almost cost me the game. If you look over here, you got the not a whole lot going on in here. The Marauders will build outposts, and then their outposts will gradually level up. And then they will build out more ships. And you, they'll snowball pretty quickly if you let them get a foothold. In this case, there was another faction we'll get to later that cleared out some territory. And the Marauders jumped in. Now, there wasn't, again, there wasn't that much in there. But what they'll do is they'll send out these frigates, raiding frigates, where they have a whole bunch of drones inside them. And once they're outposts, again, another Mark 1, but once these get up to Mark 3, you're kind of in trouble. 
because they'll just be a big mass of stuff. Cloaking doesn't really help because these have planet-wide decloakers. They have to invade from outside the galaxy. They don't start with territory. So they'll do raids, and the higher intensity, the higher the raid strength will be. But once they get a few systems under their control, they'll be attacking more and more. And particularly if AI progress happens to be fairly low, it's going to be difficult for the AI to deal with them. But that's true of a lot of the minor factions, really. Whenever you can get the AI's help with them, it really does benefit you. So again, another playstyle thing. Leave them unchecked, and you'll regret it. And our final representative in the Feast or Famine category is the Dyson Sphere Golem. Now in this particular case, the player has a lot more choice. In fact, you completely control virtually whether it's going to be a factor or not. Because if you do nothing with the Dyson Sphere Golem, then it'll just be trapped in its own system by the AI forces that typically start there. You can see on the left side the different hack options that you have. You can download its ships, increase or decrease how many ships it produces on its own, and then you can also increase the maximum strength of it. And how relevant the Dyson Sphere actually gets depends on if you want to invest a ton in it yourself, then you can make it extremely powerful. You can make it something that dominates large sections of the galaxy by increasing its maximum strength. If you don't and you just knock out the AI to free the Dyson Sphere and let it do whatever it wants, it'll send out ships in its general area. It'll have a pretty hard time wipe dealing with the AI reconquest waves and whatnot that will come in and it won't have that much of an effect. A major consideration is its location in the galaxy. If it's by a critical choke point or by some other key structures, then that is really going to aid how important it is and it can be off in the middle of nowhere, behind an AI homeworld, whatever. It's generally not going to be too relevant then because you might not get to it in time. A couple of things you got to watch out for are if you're doing a lot of work with the Dyson Golem, do not let the Nanocost near it. It'll just feed them. And you'll have a much bigger problem. Also, if you have difficulty 8 or higher, the AI will spawn and Dyson antagonizers. Which will aggravate it into sending its ships after you. So if you're really going to invest a lot in the Dyson Sphere, you have to knock those out rapidly. Or you will have a very big problem as well. And so the Dyson Sphere is another faction that can have a really big impact on the game and be dominant, or it can just be there and ignored. And now we come to another Zenith, the one who's sort of in a category all of its own. The Zenith Trader. The Zenith Trader still sells stuff. You can buy up to two copies of everything it has, on different planets, but you could have everything it has on one planet, everything it has on another planet, or you could spread that out. You can see the different things that it's got there down in that list, or they'll come up in your sideline here, you know, power generator, orbital mass driver, black hole machine, various types of things that it can build. And the Zenith Trader also can sell stuff to the AI, but the stuff that sells the AI is not going to help the AI nearly as much as stuff that you can buy from it. I think this faction is the single greatest player buff of any faction that you can put in the game automatically. Like, you could give yourself high-intensity, really strong other factions, but the Zenith Trader is simply there or not. It doesn't have an intensity, but it can really boost your economy, your defenses, your options for strategic protection in certain locations, and it will simply wander around the galaxy at random, much like the Devourer. And you've got to buy stuff when it shows up on your planet. So if you're just looking for something to add to make your journey a little bit easier, give you a few extra toys, but you don't want to mess with the formula too much, Zenith Trader is your guy. And then there's the Dark Spire. All of these fun things. The Dark Spire are intractable and they feed on chaos. Anything that dies in the system that they have a vengeance generator feeds them. And they will use that to occasionally do a vengeance strike to attack and expand further in the galaxy and for more of these. Or they can share that energy with all the other vengeance generators in the galaxy, which simply means that they'll become that much more powerful in the long run. 
Here's an example of them coming in and attacking us in Ritchie here. And their ships are tend to be relatively few in number, but very difficult to destroy. Very durable. And decent weaponry. But the durability is the main thing that they pose. And they don't care who they attack. They are equal opportunity. They are random. They just want to find something to shoot at. The biggest problem that tends to result from them is that they are naturally indestructible, the Vengeance Generators are. It costs a lot of hacking to get rid of them, and it's a very painful hack. So generally, they're always going to be around. The strategy against them is don't let them grow too much by fighting a bunch in their system. If there's a capturable thing in their system, but it's not that important to you, you're best advised to leave them alone. Chaos galaxies such as this one with the Civil War, they're going to grow more. Also, if you can block them off and not give them good ways to expand and become stronger with more vintage generators, that's good as well. So they're always going to have some impact. I would say moderate to severe. But on the high end, if they get out of control, you can have thousands of strength just roaming around the galaxy and causing big problems for everybody involved. And now we come to the Game Changers. The final set of factions, this group will change your strategy for a game. And it almost doesn't even matter what intensity they're on. Like, they're going to materially and significantly affect how you play. Even if that means ending your game early with a loss. So, here we have the Natacost. And they basically walk around with all of their various ships. You can either set them to immediate invasion. That's for only the faint of heart. You can activate them via beacon like you can most factions. But what happens is, if they kill a ship, get their own copy of it, actually. And so they will snowball very quickly that way. For example, they have here a dire nucleophilic guardian. They can't build those. A lot of the stuff they can't build. V-wings they can't build. Some of it they can, like the abominations. But they will quickly move throughout the galaxy, knock stuff off, build these nanobot centers, which they will spawn more ships out of, etc., now, to fight them, you fight them with turrets, you fight them with battle stations, golems, anything that can't be nanocosted, and you want to find a way to strike at their center, because they move around in one big death ball type of thing. You see, this is over a thousand strength, and we're just over an hour into this game. This nanocost infestation should have ruined me. It didn't, because I was eventually able to destroy their hive, which you can't even see. It's way back here. But if you can destroy their main hive, their main center, then all of them will die seconds afterwards. Every nanocost ship in the galaxy, they don't build turrets, they don't build static defenses, they're not concerned with defending their territory very much, they just have this roving, growing, snowballing mass that's, um, you know, going to just wipe out the galaxy if you don't keep them in check. So if you release the nanocost at the beginning of the game, or if you release them when you don't have a really good handle on the galaxy and how you're going to defend against them and keep them from being too ridiculously large, well, enjoy that pine box that your hopes for winning the game just went into. Because that's probably what's going to happen. They are not to be trifled with. The nanocost are scary things. Then there are the Scourge, which I covered a bit recently. But the Scourge are one of the factions that was added in the Spire Rises expansion, and they really add some time pressure to the game. You cannot leave them alone. You cannot be passive. You have to keep them small, or you will soon be made very small by them. So they start out with these little neophyte things. They go around gather metal, which they bring to their spawners. They use the spawners to create more units. Soon you'll have them build an armory. <laughs> and they'll gradually be leveling these up as they go, as they're able, as they spread out. And these will build generally standard warriors, and then they'll build specific classes of warriors, like Pelshians or Thoraxians or Burlusts, etc. All those races from another Arkan game, the last federation. They'll build defensive structures like this, and they'll level those up. And then once they max out the mark level for their specialized warriors, they'll combine a couple of them together into hybrids, which are much stronger and more powerful. And then they'll build subjugators, which are one of their elite units. Then they'll build a nemesis, which is virtually unstoppable force. Generally, if a nemesis spawns for a hostile scourge, 
if you've got a powerful, powerful empire, you might survive it. But they are just relentless on the attack once they get big enough. And they're going to constantly get big enough if you give them time and territory. Also, the more science you gather, the faster they grow because they're studying what you're doing. So that makes it even better. You've got to keep them small. Keep them from marking up their buildings very much. You've got to cut off sections from the galaxy and not let them snowball. Then, of course, if they're allied with you, you want to gain as much territory as possible, contiguous territory, because they like to spread out a little bit, and just unleash them. So that's more of a high AI progress style. Played a low AI progress game, Scourge aren't going to help you very much as an ally. But beware them as a foe. The Fallen Spire is a basically a totally alternate way of playing the game, which is why I put them even above the Scourge. Because they provoke a one-on-one -on -one confrontation with the AI, as I'm sure you know if you've seen the previous runs or the review I did of the expansion. You can build all kinds of other systems. They're essentially <coughs> a whole other race that the AI fears. And you can build much more powerful things. You can get Spire fleets and fortresses and defenses. But you also get a much worse reaction from the AI with all their extra galactic war stuff. So no more sneaking around, no more insurgency. It's an open, brutal fight to the finish with a alternate victory condition that I will leave unspoiled for those who have not seen it. If you like big fleets, massive walls of turrets, epic battles, Fallen Spire is the faction for you, but beware putting it on high intensity because it's a reasonably strong challenge even on the default middling five. And last but not least, we simply have the AI. Obviously, the AI is going to be the biggest factor in any game that you play, even if it's not the most difficult one, simply because you win by eliminating the AI. AI betrayed us during the human civil war, and we must crush them. At the beginning of the game, you will get wave attacks, and then you'll get CPAs later, and possibly wormhole invasions if you aggravate it too much. And as you boost AI progress up by taking its territory, more and more things will happen. And until you destroy the AI homeworld, if you've played AI War too much at all, you're aware of this, it will continue fighting and fighting and fighting. And that's if you don't turn Civil War on, which makes things much, much worse. But regardless, the AI and humanity are mortal enemies. It's the basic story, and you kill them, or they kill you. So that's what I think of the various impacts of the factions on your typical gameplay in AI War 2. Again, let me know what you think down in the comments and what other AI War 2 topics you might like me to cover in the future. Until that happens, thanks for watching everybody. Hope to see you soon in the next video.